Okay, um, I'm a practicing architect, and uh, I've been through the same modernist um, architectural education as everybody else. And I was also actually quite convinced modernist architect, I would say, far, quite f um, uh, far into working life after uh, architecture studies. Um, we talked, uh, I, I would like to talk to today about, um, there were, for me it was a very long process of getting, you know, breaking out of modernist thinking. Um, and there was, I will introduce to you today one thing that was perhaps the most, you know, singular, most important thing that um, gave me this freedom. Um, last week we talked about, uh, on Friday, we talked about uh, the power of, um, of language, how modernist architecture has managed to establish itself um, and maintain the dominant position for 100 years through the use of language and rhetorics. And it's a difficult discussion to, you know, just have word against word. So my ambition today is to give at least one thing from, you know, one hard fact from science that supports um, criticism of modernist architecture. What you see here is a lightning, or it could also be roots of a tree or uh, rivers in a drainage basin. You see lines breaking off at some point, and it breaks off again, and breaks off again, so it becomes increasingly detailed. And this is the phenomenon of fractals in, in mathematics and also in nature. This can be um, the, the degree to which this line, or the, you know, the speed, how fast it breaks off into another line can be quantified in something called a fractal dimension, which is a number from one to two. It's always between one and two, where one is a line that never breaks, it's just straight, or it can be objects that are exactly the same size, whereas two represents infinite change, right? So it's a line that breaks so often that it just fills the whole space, uh, or, or um, objects that are infinitely smaller than the previous one. And this is everywhere in nature, uh, something between one and two. What you see in the bottom here uh, is the underside of a cloud. It can also be um, treetops of a forest. It can be surface of a, of a rock. Um, and scientists have studied, um, or mathematicians have studied uh, fractals in nature and found that it's surprisingly, um, there's a surprising tendency towards fractals being in the range of 1.3 to 1.5, you know, everywhere, from molecules to planetary systems. There's like, there's um, the same physiological, geological, biological processes that govern nature, and you will find that, you know, uh, tendency everywhere. So, nature is inherently rugged or bumpy, right? It's very seldom straight. And scientists have also studied uh, human perception of fractals. What, are there any fractals that are, you know, more pleasant to look at than others? And there are. Um, I've studied neuroscience, so that's sort of my background here today. There's uh, environmental psychology and on one side, and there's neuroscience on the other. You can, you can ask people what they like. That's one method. You can also use a lot of methods like, uh, you know, scan the, the pupil dilatation, uh, skin conductance, uh, heart rate, brain imaging. There are so many tools to determine uh, the experience of pleasure. And scientists have found that the fractal dimension uh, in that, you know, it's more, most comfortable for people that generates pleasure in people is between 1.3 and 1.5. Which is not a big surprise, right? Because we are, through evolution, adapted to functioning well in this environment. So, um, it's only natural that that's what we found, we, we find, you know, beautiful. And this you can also do with, you know, any kind of built or natural environment. You can do an image 
um, digital image analysis of any scene or any um, you know, environment and determine, you quantify the fractal dimension of that scene or, <coughs> or environment. And scientists have studied non-modernist uh, architecture across uh, you know, time and, and place. And look what they found, that, well, they have fractal dimensions that are also around 1.3 to 1.5. It's also not a surprise, because that's how the evolution of architecture has been, right? So it says non-modernist architecture, because modernist architecture will be, like, closer to 1, which is, you know, entropy, or, you know, lack of energy. Um, So when we go to architecture uh, from nature, we don't have the same biological and geological processes that you know just generates what is beautiful. We have to create it, you know, by hand, uh, and we need to be practical because uh, we have tools. You know, even you know industrial or pre-industrial, it it always ends up being a little bit straight, and we need to create you know this beauty that comes naturally in nature. Um, so, you know, basically his, his history of architecture is an evolution in how to mimic the ruggedness and bumpiness of nature and the structure and the hierarchy that you find in nature. In a way, in architecture that's also, you know, possible to build and with hands and it's, it's, you know, fits with the society of that time and whatever it needs also to, to comply with. So, like, this building here, typically, you can see it's divided into three, and then the wall is maybe divided into window and not window, or maybe columns, and then the window is then subdivided into smaller parts, and then all the way down to the screws. And there's like a, a, a great um, hierarchy of details from the screws to the roof, right? And, and everything is, is the organized details on many levels. And whereas fractals in nature you know, at least theoretically, are in indefinite scales. Typically, in, in traditional buildings, there will be maybe around seven scales, because that's what, you know, building 100 levels of details is just too expensive. Seven is what you need, or five or something. And when people say that, okay, maybe Villa Savoie by Corbusier is designed by um, golden section or something, it's correct. You know, you have one level of scale. It's, you know, the... the the height versus uh, compared to the, the width or something, but that stops there, right? There's nothing more after that. Um, there are a lot. Of, there's a substantial research in, uh, especially environmental psychology, also neuroscience, the last 30, 40 years, which is just ignored by architectural community. Um, one of the heavyweights is Arthur Stamps who, um, you know, very, this is a very short presentation, summarizes um, his findings that um, people enjoy, um, you know, people's pleasure, it's more or less what I said, uh, people's pleasure in looking at buildings or environments increase with increased complexity of uh, silhouettes of objects and, and um, and buildings. So the more twists and turns there are in the in the silhouettes of buildings and subcomponents of buildings, the more pleasure, right? So there it is. Uh, the more, the better. Or to put it another way, less is not more. Less is maybe just less. Another um, heavyweight is Kaplan and Kaplan. You can all, there are books on these people you can, you can look up later. Whose research has been summarized by the Norwegian environmental psychologist Einar Slumse as being conceptualized as understand and explore. That all these levels of fractals or details allow you to uh, understand what you're looking at and to explore it. Um, so, yeah, you, you can see there is a roof on this building, then it relates to the sky, it relates to the top of the trees, you know, you know where we are in the world compared to stuff on the ground, where, where there's an entrance door and stuff that relates to the street. So, that way you find your way in the world and you can, 
you can understand your, your surroundings and feel safe. Um, and modernist architecture is the opposite of this. You know, the whole point of modernist architecture is abstraction. A roof should not be a roof. A balcony should not be a, roof, a balcony. It should be, should be just abstract form. And the whole point is that you should not easily understand that it's a balcony. It should, should be an abstract experience of, of form. Um, so we can see it also in these everyday objects, all the stuff you get for Christmas, these uh, square pepper grinders that you, you don't know where, how to put the pepper in or out of this uh, thing, or the, you know, the soap dispenser you got for Christmas the year before that, where you don't know where to put the soap uh, into it or get it out of it. These are like overly, you know, over-designed objects uh, based on these ideas of abstract form. The object is not telling you how it, how it works, how you put pepper on the food. So um, I just wanted to use this facade and run through how does it look like when we just strip off these useless, uh, unfunctional fact fractals. So let's take away the cake decoration. It looks like this. Uh, we can take away the mullions, mullions in the windows so we have a better view of the modernist building across the street. We can uh, take away the roof eaves or the, you know, the extension beyond the facade because why would you prevent rainwater from running down the facade and grow into fungus around the windows? That's, that's the expression of our times, you know, fungus around the windows. <laughs> and, you know, material on the roof should be the same as on the wall because it should be one abstract form and you should be able to see all the bird shit on the roof. That's honest, right? Um, architects have been very good at um, accepting irrefutable scientific uh, evidence of um, climate change and adapting that into architecture quite strongly. I urge the same architects to accept irrefutable scientific evidence of universal human preference, uh, sorry, <laughs> preferences in architecture, um, and with that, embrace the function of ornament. And this can take many forms. Uh, I think that the only responsible uh, action based on this is to start copying. I mean, just let's just say that modernism was an experiment. Okay, that's fine. There were some good things and quite some bad things. We're done with that. Let's just go back to what, whatever was be before modernist architecture and just, let's just start copying that, you know? That would be the most responsible thing to do from any other, you know, perspective, from other, if you go into other fields of, uh, in society, you know, uh, nutrition or, you know, car safety, I don't know, anything. If you fail, you go back to where you were before and, and you just say, okay, well, that was an experiment. Um, so, yeah, let's start copying uh, architecture from, from before modernism. That's the only reasonable thing to do, I think. But it could, you know, also take new forms. Our society today is, of course, also uh, different in many good ways than compared to 19th century uh, or before. So, um, by copying something old, you know, you don't need to force it. Things will become different anyway. It's, you know, any time in architectural history where people have at some point thought, okay, this is bad, let's go back to whatever was so, you know, much better before, they, in a way, they, they always failed because they always put themselves into the copying. There was also some, always something contemporary that made that into something new in that, in that sense. And we can, and that will happen now also. Um, modernist, ar modernist architects always say that it's a pity to, you know, leave behind the freedom, design freedom of, of modernist architecture and go back to copying and, and you know, because traditions are so rigid and, and uh, you know, fixed, it's, it's not creative. But I think it's completely the other way around. Uh, after I've, you know, managed to break free from modernist thinking, I only experience freedom, a new freedom of design. You can do, you can really do what you want, anything. Thank you. <laughs>